just a quick note on housekeeping. We have a lot of people on the call today, so all lines are muted. Um, but we really want to hear from you, so please post all questions and comments in the questions panel to the right. We'll address some of these throughout the presentation, and those we don't get to, we'll look at the end in the questions and answers section. Okay, so some of you may have seen this slide before. It's called the Salesforce Safe Harbor Statement and can be viewed in full on our website. It's just enough to say that in case we speak about future products, you should also you should always purchase based on what we have commercially available today. Now, just for some quick introductions. My name is Neve Lacey. I run digital marketing for the foundation in EMEA and will be the moderator for today's webinar. And our main speaker we're delighted to have is Daniel Probert, who is head of IT innovation at CAMSET. For those of you who are not familiar with Salesforce Foundation, I'm going to give you a really quick overview so you have an idea of what we do. The founder of Salesforce, Mark Benioff, formed the company 16 years ago and he had a simple but powerful vision for integrated philanthropy. And that's what we call the 111 model. Mark committed 1% of his employees' time, 1% of product, and 1% of the founding equity to be given back into the community. And today that equates to those figures that you see in the slide here. Today there are 25,000 nonprofits around the world using Salesforce to access through the Power of Us program. The program, which is managed by the Salesforce Foundation, offers 10 free delayed licenses to all eligible nonprofits. And it also offers additional licenses at up to 76% discount, with all revenue funneled straight back into the community through our philanthropic programs and grants. This means that the Salesforce Foundation has a fully self self-sustaining social enterprise model. Nonprofits have been hugely successful in adopting our technology and have seen benefits create their entire organization as a result. So enough about us. I want to now pass you over to our speaker, Daniel Probert. Daniel, you're very welcome. Um, I hope you all enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just show my screen. Okay, so my name is Daniel Prober. Uh, I'm Head of IT Innovation for CAMFED International. I've been with the organization for three and a half years, having previously never worked in this sector, or more importantly, I think for this particular call, never worked or even seen anything of Salesforce. Um, I've spent 18 years in IT, primarily focused around IT infrastructure and working in challenging environments, which is why CAMFED kind of struck a chord with me as an excellent place to come and work. CAMFED are an international not-for-profit uh, with programs operating in five countries and we're expanding that at the moment to a sixth with offices in, with eight offices worldwide and 180 staff supporting our efforts. We have a very strong community activist network of 130,000 teachers, uh, community members, mothers, fathers, all working on the support and the delivery of this program. And together, with our community activists, we managed to deliver the support for 198,000 students in 2014, which is quite substantial considering the number of staff that we have working on this. Um, our core mission is to multiply educational opportunities for girls and empower young women to become leaders of change. And we've been recognized by the OECD for our systems and our approach to this. Our model, um, Girls Education is the entry point to widespread systemic change uh, and we can actually show some very good strong evidence that this is the case and I, I'd like to take you through the virtuous cycle because I think it is a fantastic sign and evidence that what, what we're doing with girls education and the importance of girls education and specifically a community led program does for the women that we support. So I'm going to introduce you to Angie. Now I personally know Angie and that's why I thought it'd be very nice to bring a bring her on to the screen to introduce you all to her. Angie, in childhood, got one of the highest primary school exam marks in all of Zimbabwe. She managed her way through primary school by washing dishes for teachers in exchange for pens, attending barefoot and in a torn dress. Secondary school seemed out of reach for her family, substance farmers who would not be able to pay the fee. CAMFED offered Angie a bursary that paid these fees and for a uniform and other supplies. In adolescence, Angie attended secondary school along with other bursary students supported by CAMFED. They became known as the Cotton Girls. These are the first girls that were supported by CAMFED. And 
they became a support network for one another through school, which was crucial, which is a crucial element even to this day, 21 years later, for the CAMFED model, that these girls work together and support one another through school. In young adult, adulthood, offering uh, economic and educational opportunities, Angie and about 300 of her peers helped to establish something which is still growing to this day, which is the CAMFED network, uh, the, or the CAMFED alumni, as you'll see that I I mentioned them further on in the presentation. And this is a peer support network working back in the local community to support young women uh, and help support girls through education. Angie, obviously quite a bright star because of the grades she received in school, has now gone on into a leadership role within her community and more importantly is now the regional executive director for CAMFED in Zimbabwe and Malawi. So not only has she been providing support for girls within her local community to go to school, and this isn't support that CAMFED provides, she provides it herself. But she now has the opportunity to change the lives of hundreds of thousands of girls across Malawi, Zimbabwe, Tanzania and Zimbabwe. Now, personally, I always feel if you ever need uh, evidence that what you're doing makes a difference, you just need to look at Angie's story. But Angie is one of 33,000 CAMA members that all have an equally amazing story of how they've come from extreme poverty through education to become leaders of change within their communities. Um, and you'll notice throughout this I mentioned communities. We call them structures internally and I'm, I'm sticking with the term here because it's something that you'll see when I give a demonstration of our database. But all of these community structures that are in place or we help to advise on how to put in place come together for the support of that girl right there in the middle. You have district level education officials, you have mother support groups that come together to ensure that students are being fed, um, that they're receiving the correct entitlements, and school management committees that observe their attendance for us and help feed back to us on any girls that are dropping out. Um, obviously we have our own internal resource teams as well that go out and monitor and collect information to ensure that our programs are being effective. Now CAMFED, I, I talked about the CAMFED uh, alumni, CAMA, and their multiplier effects, and you can see here on, on screen there are five examples of five CAMA members that all went through our bursary program and have now gone on to become leaders of change within their community. Fiona there uh, went on to become a qualified lawyer and is now working on a consulting basis with CAMFED and helping us to roll out further CAMA initiatives and reconnect the CAMA network, which as I said is 33,000 um, women. Um, there's, a, there's another, I wanted to add another one on here about two Ghanaian women that were trained in health education in Ghana as well as financial awareness and they took it off their own back without support from CAMFED to go and approach a local radio station to set up a radio session which is 30 minutes a week um, where they go on and they answer questions that are, are, are called in from the general public to help with any financial issues they might have or how to save or how to earn money, how to improve your business. Um, and that's just one example of how these women once they've been given the access to education and now looking to improve the lives of their communities that they live in. And obviously it's very important for us to measure this. We, we rely on donors to help fund this and help us to expand our programs and innovate within our programs. The ability to be able to measure all this success can only be achieved with good systems and good system management. Um, and this is where Salesforce comes in. We do quite a lot with Salesforce. I, I can't really think of many things that we don't do in Salesforce. We've pretty much wholeheartedly moved everything into Salesforce with the, the most recent thing we've moved in being our finance system. So every aspect of our program is managed through Salesforce. Every aspect of our finances are now managed through Salesforce. All donor management, grants, any marketing management, email, newsletters are sent directly from Salesforce. Our HR management, we recently rolled out a self-service system that enable Salesforce users to register their leave, view historic leaves, re like review their 360 appraisals or anything related to HR, providing centralized management for our HR team. And then the obvious ones, IT management and document management. Within this webinar, I'm gonna try and cover quite a lot, I think, but hopefully not too much. But I thought I'd give a quick outline of what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna show you one of our custom applications. We've got 16 custom applications and I'm gonna traverse through that application across some of our custom objects. Now, the vanilla version of Salesforce comes with something called a standard object. And for those of you that aren't aware of what an object is, if you imagine you've got an Excel spreadsheet open 
one of those tabs might be an object. Um, and within that object, you can have many rows, which would be records, and many columns, which could represent fields within an object. Um, so I'm going to go through a few of our custom objects that we set up ourselves internally um, using some online tools to assist us and sending people on the right kind of training. Um, I'm also going to take you through some examples of formulas where we calculate information off of other information, something called roll-ups, which is a very useful tool for being able to summarize information at higher levels for reporting and viewing. Uh, one of my favorite subjects is URL hacking. Um, it sounds dodgy, but it's just a really cool way of creating one report that rather than having one report hard-coded for a specific requirement, you can feed information directly from a record into that report to, to view the information. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on examples of how you can use triggers. I'm not going to go into the code, but a trigger in effect is a mechanism for when a record is saved, updating information on a different bit of uh, on a different record, and that could happen on insert, so when you first add it or when you update it. And we'll look at a couple of workflows and examples of where we're using workflows. Um, but unfortunately, I can't really demonstrate because I've turned off emails in my uh, org. The organisation that I'm going to be giving this demonstration in, because we're very, we have a very strong child protection plan, has to be running from something called a sandbox. If you're a current Salesforce uh, Foundation user, you will have access to, I think, five sandboxes. And a sandbox basically provides you with the ability to take a complete snapshot of your entire live Salesforce minus the data, and play about with it, mess about, add things, create reports, add data, and experiment and, and as I say, play with different ways of changing the way your system works um, without affecting any of your live users. So you can even get live users to log into the sandbox to test how things work. Um, I've customized this to remove a lot of the additional information. So it's a very cut-down version of our Salesforce and of this specific program or application that I'm going to be looking at. Um, I'm going to give you a demo as well of something that Peter Chichum developed for us. Now, Peter Chichum's an MVP with Salesforce. Um, and as I'm sure you're all aware, the foundation, I believe, offer five days of free support to um, Salesforce Foundation customers. So Peter, we met back in 2010, 2011, and he did some fantastic work for us. And I'm going to give you an example of one of the things that he's done for us to give you an idea on the kind of things that you may not necessarily be aware that you can do within Salesforce. And then I'm going to be a little bit risky and do a live demo of something that we've built ourselves, which is a live SMS system that is externally connected to a SMS gateway. Um, and to show you the ability to log and respond to information within Salesforce using external applications. So if I flick over to my sandbox now. <clears throat> okay, so this is my Salesforce org, and as you can see, it may, it may be familiar to all of you. You get the standard layout that you all recognize, but this is our custom application. It's no different to any of the vanilla ones that you get. The only difference is we've created our own application tab up here called Program Database. And we've created all these custom objects here, countries, districts, schools, meetings and activities, structures. These are all custom objects that we've added ourselves, added tabs, and added into the application. Now, if you think back to our model and the importance that we put with a girl within the system, I'm going to go into contacts and start off the demonstration by, by moving from a girl as a student through the system to show how data relates and how you can very quickly move within the system. So if I go into contacts, I'll get my list of contacts. And I'm going to select a bursary student. And you can see I've got some information there already. But when I open the page, so this is the kind of stuff that we collect. And as I said, this is cut back. This is just tailored for this demonstration. And I can see here there are bits I can change. So I can update these just by double clicking on them. I can update to say that she's fostered if I needed to. And this is all managed by our program teams in country. And um, some of this data, and I'll show you aspects of the data that comes in from our mobile monitoring program. Our mobile monitoring program is based on an open source platform that runs on mobile phones. Uh, and it consists of enumerators with questionnaires on their phones that visit schools 
or potentially teacher mentors that are already in schools that will collect and provide us with information about the students that we support. So if I come down here, so you can see that we've We've got her name here, and this is now one of the standard vanilla Salesforce uh, objects. So I can change first name, last name, and you can see here, I've got a couple of these links here. So this is where we start to build out our relationship to enable more granular reporting. We could have just put a pick list in for Zimbabwe as an example, as a country. However, if we put a pick list here, when we come to add additional information to Zimbabwe as a country, we'd have to replicate that pick list. And so for reporting, it's easier for us to create a model where we have Zimbabwe as its own particular home within Salesforce almost. So if I click on Zimbabwe, and I will come back to this student, you'll see here that Zimbabwe is its own unique record, which has related records attached to that as well. And you can see districts, structures, uh, some of the built-in features like Google Docs, and content, which we quite heavily use now in Salesforce to link content to specific locations where you might be in within the database. So if someone comes into Salesforce and comes to our Zimbabwe country, say our development team looking to find information, they can very quickly see a list of districts, a list of structures, and they can see, um, this is only a small example, but you can see two districts here, when the inception was, uh, and whether the number of active schools and the total number of schools and if there, it's an active partner district. And then there's a couple of bits here that are where we start to link in our finance system. Because finance is now directly within Salesforce, we're very, it's very easy for us to relate information directly back to our finance system. And this enables us to ensure that when we're reporting on any activity, we don't have to reconcile two different databases. We know that there is only one Zimbabwe. We know that there is only one Bulawayo as a district or one Gel bursary pupil, um, which makes reconciliation of all of our information much easier and also reduces accidental duplicate payments or anything like that or the loss of information. So if I click through to Bulawayo, so now this is where we start to be a little bit more creative of what we're doing and so if you think back, I joined three and a half years ago and I had very little exposure to Salesforce or knowledge on what you could do. Um, and so I started to do some research and I was being asked simple questions like how can we have a map that we can click on a link from anywhere and it will appear on a page so we can see where we are so that our resource teams in country are able to very quickly figure out the best way to go. So this, is a, this here is a formula field that we created in Salesforce that is very simple. All it is is this is the URL field that does that search that you can see in there and this has now taken me to Bulawayo and I can start looking at getting directions there if I'm, if I'm within the country and I'm interested in that kind of thing. And that was a formula field that we actually found on the Power of Us Hub. We posted a question, um, must have been just after it first came live. How can you roll out a, a simple link to Google Maps? Um, and I got pointed in the direction of a Salesforce support document, which was on fields and field formulas. And so from there, it's helped me to expand my knowledge on how to do different things with, with fields and field formulas. So if I go back and give you an example of another very simple field formula for a student, is how to calculate an age. Now I can think of how to do that in Excel, but the Excel formula doesn't necessarily work straight out of the box. So I started to look at how I could create a formula that if I change this date to it updates the age correctly. So you can see there, the age automatically changes. So if I needed to do a report across all of my bursary pupils to get an average age, I have this age field. No longer do I have to take birth date, which is a default Salesforce field, out of Salesforce and then do that work in Excel, which is, quite, which is what historically we've always done. And that was a very simple thing for us to do. And, and, and I, I'm not gonna lie, that all came directly from the community support that we, we found available at that particular time. So if we carry on looking at this bursary pupil and start to explore some of the related records, it's at this point that I can start to explain some of the workflows that we have running on this particular page, and triggers and roll-up summaries. So this academic information here, so this information isn't on this record. None of this information is actually on this record. It's a snapshot that we're pulling from a related record. 
Now we've done that through a series of, of what I think of slight tricks, but they're very simple things to get up and running. I, did, I went on to developerforce.com, went on to the developer forum and asked a question, how can I create a trigger that will enable me to, from a child record, which is one of these related records here, update the parent record with information? And immediately I had, I think his name's Scott Bowden, or I can't remember his name, or Simon Goodyear. It's one, it was one of the UK MVPs that came back. And not only did they come back with an answer, they came back with a direct link to a tutorial immediately on how I could get this up and running, uh, what steps I'd need to take, um, and if I get stuck, drop me a line and they'll help me through it which is something I'd, I'd not come across before. And so thanks to them, I was able to create something that enables me to, if I go into this record here, I'm gonna make an edit on this record and I'm gonna change the form to form two. And I'm going to save it. And so now if I, if I look here, you'll see this form two has been amended. It's automatically updated onto the parent record which enables my team, the program team, our impact team and everyone to know that when an academic record has been attached to a contact record, the information they're reporting on a contact record is accurate. Now that, that's been done with a trigger, um, which is a, it's, it's a little bit more complex than the average admin would, would be able to do. But with the support of the community, a very non-admin person as I was in the beginning was able to get this up and running uh, relatively quickly. Um, so if we go off to schools and we'll start to look at some of the roll-up summary options. So you'll see this is an example of a school that we have and you'll see here and this is something that we've put throughout the system is a map. We collect the GeoPoint on every single school that we visit. Uh, we have I believe at last count approximately 5,200 partner schools and for each and every one of them we have this GeoPoint which enables us to provide a link on every single school that will open a Google map and take you directly to where the school is. And so if I do that, you can see here, that's the school, and we can see that school, and we can see the accuracy is pretty good because the school entrance is there, and that's probably where the reporting would have taken place. And um, so, so it's one of those, it's a very simple thing to do, but it's quite effective for en enabling new members of staff or even old members of staff to get a better picture of where our schools are or where anything is that they may need to visit. Um, now if we look at the school record in more detail, you'll see here that we've got this active pupils and total pupils three and four. Now the relationship of data in Salesforce, if you have a object, there's something called a, we'll call it a master object, which is the very top of a tree, and then you have a child object underneath it. Um, so if we, if we think of a parent and a child, you can set up two different types of relationships between them, um, but Salesforce has a limit on how these relationships work. One of them is a master relationship, um, and with a master relationship, you can do something called roll-up summary fields, which enable you to roll up certain bits of information from your child records, which is very useful. However, there is a limitation on the number of these that you can put on a record. There is another relationship that you can set up, which is something called a lookup relationship. And there isn't really a limit on the number of lookups that you can put in place. But one of the most painful for me limits that is in place, but there's a way around it and I'll talk about it in a second, is that you can't use roll up summary fields on a, look, a standard lookup relationship. And so it was quite a bugbearer for me and I started to investigate different ways around it. Um, spoke to quite a few MVPs, so I asked Peter Chicham about it, who's the MVP that we'd already done work with. Simon Goodyear as well. I attended two of the UK Salesforce uh, events down in Canary Wharf um, and every single developer said, oh, you'll need a developer to do it until I met a guy called Andy Fawcett who turned around and said, have you ever heard of a, a, a free tool that's on the App Exchange called Declarative Lookup Rollup Summaries? Um, I said, no. And so I started to look into this, and it's a free tool that I managed to install. And it's based entirely off of clicks to create the effect of what a lot of code and a lot of effort that developers will charge quite a lot of money if you go to external developers to put in place. I managed to follow four very simple YouTube videos. And before I knew it, I had these 
roll up summaries working that were working live within the system. And if I give you an example, so you can see here that we've got three active pupils and four total pupils. So I'm going to go to this pupil number four and I'm going to mark her as being active. So I'm going to save that. And then I'm going to go back to my school. Oh, typical, it doesn't work. Okay, let me add a new contact. Okay. I'm just going to save that as the basic information, but not have them as active. Go back to the school. Okay, so now you can see that it has actually recalculated. It's, it's Sometimes it isn't perfect, but for free I'm quite happy with that. So me adding a new contact has updated that to be correct. So if I look down here, I can clearly see there are five contacts, four of them are marked as active within the system. Um, and so with that tool I was able to save a lot of time and more importantly I was able to roll something out without having to go to an external organization which despite having 180 staff, the, the idea of going to an external third party is still quite daunting because the amount of time and effort you can spend explaining your requirements to a third party is, is quite scary and we've, we've had some good experiences, we've had some bad experiences with third parties. I'm not going to say we've never used third parties, but we've, we've, we're not entirely positive on the outcomes that we've had from some of them. Um, and so, so through the community I was able to find this very simple tool on the App Exchange, which enabled me to put this in place and it normally does work better than that. This is my sandbox which does play up a little bit. Um, but you can start to get an idea on how some of these things work. So while I'm on the school page, what I'd like to show you is something that Peter Chichen built for us, and I think of it as quite a magical button. So every term we have, every year we collect information on a student. If I look at a student record for you, you can see something called an academic record here. And what you'll see is we collect them for each year, and you can see here 2013, 2014, 2015. And every year we roll that over so that we can collect dedicated information for the following year to enable us to maintain that historical record of what happened at a point in time. So as you can see, if, if I wanted to roll this student over, I've got, without this magic button I'm going to show you a demo of in a minute, I've got two options. Number one is I can manually go through each student, click on new academic record, and then start creating the academic record. It's quite scary when you're talking about 198,000 students in 2014 for us. Um, the other option is that we could create a report in Salesforce of all the current students, export that from Salesforce, and hope that during the use of data loader that no files are missed or no, no information is missed that could cause issues or accidental deletions of data or the wrong information going in, which can sometimes lead to some pains on trying to fix or even sometimes find that, that information. So working with Peter two and a half, three years ago, he developed this button here which allows us on a school level, and we're now looking to try and talk to him about doing it on a district level, to do this. So if I press this button, this is now going to run off in the background using some clever coding that he's developed to look at this school and look for all students at this school that are currently active with an academic record um, that is within the remits of a school period, i.e. they're not in their last year of school. So if I just wait for this to open, so it's going to, it should come back with three students, I think. No, with four students, okay. So we've got four students here, and you can see here, current form, current form, current form, and current year. So I'm, I get this simple tick box here, and if you can imagine, most of our schools have got 100 to 150 students within them. So the ability to do this on a school where you can just tick the people that are progressing or if you've got other schools in the system you can transfer them to a different school is, is a major time saver for us um, and that's why we're now as we've continued to grow looking to expand this and move this upper level so we can do it at a district level. So I'm going to click to create a new record and you can see here so 
So remember there were four records and I've only selected three. You can see here it's created new records and it's already marked them as the new forms. It's added on a form because he's built in the logic to understand that if a student's in form one, they should be progressing to form two. It's updated the year to be the current year. Now the most important thing for us on this is it's copied over all the key information that we've coded in the background to ensure the academic records are set up correctly and without us needing to check or test to see if the data is correct. There's some information that we intentionally leave blank and that's because it needs to be updated each year. So if I come back here now, you can see here, so this last academic year has now been updated to 2016. And if I go in here, you see that this academic record has been updated here. I can see that she now has four here, which is correct. But I can already see what's missing. And the reason that we don't copy over the donor code is because our donor codes change as they do with most organizations. From year to year, we may not have the same donor funding for 2016. And so it's, it's the responsibility of our program team, of our finance team, to once they've progressed as, through the academic records, to then go in and update donor codes to ensure they're correct. So you can see that's quite a powerful and simple tool, and that was something that Peter did in about three and a half days for us. Um, he had a little bit of time left over at the end where he developed something else for us, which enables us to do a roll-up summary of attachments on an individual record as well, which is something which, again, is a lifesaver for us. Um, if I now, I'm going to give a little bit of a demo of an external interaction. Now, this is a live demo, so I'm hoping it's going to work. So this is a teacher mentor, and you, this is a, something else that's very important to see. This is still a contact. It's just it's got a different contact record type, and attached to the different record contact record type is a completely different page layout. So if I open up a different contact, and you can see that they are still contacts, for those of you not familiar with how record types and page layouts look, so this is a contact, this has this record type, and this is the page layout for it, with these related lists. If I now look at a teacher mentor, they've got different related lists and completely different fields on the pages. Having this flexibility enables you when you're adding data to the system to ensure the right data is going on the right record and you can add validations against all of these as well. But if I come down the page, we have this section down here called SMSs. So, so following on from the work with Peter uh, and me becoming more and more familiar with the system and understanding one of the requirements of the organization, one of the requests I got from the organization was we want the ability to be able to track our SMS communications with our teacher mentors, our enumerators, anyone basically that's working with us within the field. So I went off and did some research uh, and I found a guy who, I never found what his real name is. I know he's an MVP but his Twitter handle is Tech Nerd or something along those lines. Um, and he entered a competition two years ago to create a very simple SMS sending mechanism within Salesforce that uses a third party SMS gateway. Um, but the code wasn't available, so I dropped him an email and just said, hey, I see you're an MVP, any chance you could share the code with me? And as I found with every Salesforce MVP, there was no question of sharing it. He immediately sent me a link saying, here it is, have a look through, give me a shout if you get stuck with anything, or go over to the developer forums and ask questions on there. So with that code, I was able to create something that enables our team, and this is a very small version of it, there's a much bigger version where you can create groups and send messages to many people all in one go. But for the purpose of the demo, I'm just gonna send a very simple SMS and show you it being logged. So you'll see when I pressed on new there, it pulled across information from the contact record. So it's pulled across the teacher mentor, who the person is, up and my contact, and their phone number. So if I go back, you'll see on the record here, that we have their mobile phone number stored there. So it's automatically pulling it across. Now that isn't a default thing that you get out of Salesforce. We've created, and again this was something I found online on one of their tutorials, a custom button here that allows us to press send SMS and it updates the actual link that we're clicking through to with this information and populates with date sent or the sending date as it actually is, uh, and predefines this record. 
so that I don't have to go through and change anything else. So I'm going to add a test message into here. And I'm going to send. Okay, so that, that's now sent. Um, and if I just very quickly check to see if it actually has, yep. So if I go on to here, and this is just so that you can show it, so I can show you that it's working. So this has come from our US uh, phone number that we've got set up within our demo org, and you can see the exact message there. So now if you imagine you've communicated with someone in the field, you obviously want to see the response, but you want to log that response when it comes back in. So I'm going to reply back to the message using this tool here, and I'm going to say, and send. And so now I should see it in my pending queue here, and in a couple of seconds that's going to disappear off. Let's just quickly check it has sent. Sorry, I'm just checking something on a different screen. Yep, so now if I go back to my teacher mentor, and I'll scroll down the page, you can see here that there's a new message that's just been added. 37, yep, that's right. And it's marked as unread. Now, this is where workflows come in. We have workflows attached to these SMS messages so that if you're within a specific country and you work within our program team and a, and a member or an enumerator or a teacher mentor sends an SMS in, they will immediately get a flag, a message to say that an SMS has been received into the system. And so when they open that SMS, they'll see here, thanks for your help, hope that works. Um, they can see that it, when it came in, they can see that it came inbound. Um, and the important thing to remember here is you see that this is marked as unread now. So if I, as soon as they've opened that record, it's automatically going to mark it as read. And that's using a workflow uh, with a small bit of code in the background that we set up. Again, I found the formula for how to do that in an online forum. So this message will now be, flag now be flagged as read. But the, more imp the most important thing for me is it also updates the last modified by person and date. So as the message comes in, if you remember back a second ago, that name was not my name. But I now have that audit trail of who's actually read that. So that if we find out a teacher mentor's message has gone unanswered, then we're able to actually see that there. Now from within this window, the person, whoever it is that responds to it, has the ability to respond back. And then send, and then again, within a couple of seconds, great speak soon. So you can see, see there that I've automatically been sending and receiving messages, and they're being received by an external party. But more importantly, everything, every action is being logged here in Salesforce in a reportable format. And you can see here that it's being sent and read, sent, and this one hasn't been read. So this one would be flagging up on a report that no one's read that. And these reports are scheduled reports that run once a week, sending them out to program managers to inform them of messages that have gone unread. Um, so if I now go back to the, the school, no, the country, I'm going to give you a quick example of URL hacking. And I've left this to the end because it's one of my favorite things to show. Um, so I'm sat here on Zimbabwe as a record. Um, and something I'm interested in at a country level is every single school broken down by district. Now I could go off and I could create a, a simple report that's hard-coded with country of Zimbabwe um, and filter all of these. But what I've done is I've created a report where I haven't included a country in it and then I've created something called a custom link here. Now if I click on this school, you're going to see this window pops up and you can see here it's pulled through the information in a very user-friendly way for me to read and again I could cut I could have customized this and added in any field I want but for the sake of the demo I thought I'd just show you how this is now the actual report itself this isn't the actual report so if I take you to the actual report to show you what that looks like um, I can't do it from that window but I can go to a report window schools. So this is the actual report that this that it's linking to. And you can see here that I've set country equals nothing. 
And this is the one of the magic of Salesforce reporting and specifically URL hacking is your ability to be able to set up a report to feed off of the specific objects that you're on. So if, if we imagine that I was on maybe not Zimbabwe or I had Ghana in there as my country, um, then using a very simple syntax that is available in the Google for in the forums, you can pass information into a report that will populate this field here. So you see here it's, it's populated it based on this. So all I've done is I've created a link here on this object that looks up the country name as a part of me pressing the button so that it's passed through into the report when I go through on it. Um, it's a very simple trick. Um, we use it all over the place. This is one very small example of how we do it. And it prevents us from being in a position where, and I'm sure some of you will come across it once you get more used to Salesforce, thousands and thousands of identical reports just broken down by one different item that actually could feed directly from the record itself. So you go to the record and at the same time as having that report, you might have additional information rather than just going straight to the school's report pre-configured. I might see an update when I'm here that's of use to me at the same time. Um, I think I've covered everything that I want to cover. And I haven't got anything else that I'd like to show. Um, has anyone got, I guess, there's one other thing that I do want to show that's probably quite important. Um, and that is the ability to, if you do manage to get hold of some good developers, or you manage to train someone in-house, um, or even get some good administrators, the dedupe data management that Salesforce released released, I think it was in spring this year, has been an absolute revolution for us on cleaning up our, our database. And I'm going to give a quick demo of how that data management works for us. So this isn't probably the best example, but it's going to be give you an idea. So, so this record here, we only allow one version of this record. There can never be two 2015 term ones. There can never be two of any of these. So if I, we've enabled the data management duplicate rules uh, uh, within the Salesforce. If I change this year and now I try and save it, I'm automatically given this. And this is the important thing. I'm given a link directly to the record that is the duplicate. I've seen this done with code before, um, and you never get that particular link there. Or I haven't seen it done in that fashion without a lot of additional work. Um, and for, for me personally, if you can get a good admin to start looking at their data management within Salesforce, you can start to really cut back on duplicates within the system. And more importantly, although there are a lot of very good tools out there to do it, you can start to just use some of the native Salesforce tools that are only going to be getting better, especially that data management, to improve the quality of your data. So I can see that's wrong, and if I cancel it, it will go back. And the same. And this is applicable, so I've got this configured for a couple of different fields to check for duplicates. So you can see there, and it's told me what one it is. And directly from there, I can go over to that record and start working from there if I actually want to. Um, so I think that's me done. Um, done. One other thing that I, I want to say, uh, and it, it's quite an important one for us personally in-house. Um, another release that we saw recently that we're starting to get some of our advanced admins, and we don't have many, we have two or three to start looking into, is the Salesforce trial in that's recently been released. Even if you've got junior admins, it's worth getting them on there to start going through some of the uh, tool, like the exercises that are on there. I've even learned something, and I now think of myself as more of an advanced admin by doing it. So thank you. Um, Dan, brilliant presentation. We just have someone asking if you can go into a little bit more detail on the triggers uh, you used on the students page. Yeah, sure. Great, What's the, what is the question? How it works? Yeah. Okay, so, so within the student page here, we have some intelligence attached to the academic record here. Um, if I come to the academic record, it's easier for me to explain. So we have every time that a trigger in Salesforce allows you to do many different things to either the record you're working on or related records at point of insert, update, or delete. 
and you can perform certain actions before or after. We have on an academic record about six different clauses attached to it. Um, before insert, after insert, before update, after update, before delete and after delete are the main ones that we put in place. Um, the delete ones predominantly to say, no, you can't delete this. And we've even gone so far as removing delete permissions. But within this record here, the, what we had to do that was slightly different, because, because there, then there's hidden fields that are managing this. We have a hidden field that depicts if this is the current record. And it does that by checking on the contact itself. So it verifies that that number there, the link to the current academic record, matches this one. If they match, then we have an if clause within our trigger that says, okay, any updates made on here, yet reflect them on the contact page. So if I update that, so I'll save. So I've set that to form four, and you can see here that's form three, but I'm gonna refresh the page. And that's now form four as well. And so that, that's one of our after update triggers that we've got running on it. Um, a before update trigger we've got, I would have to go to a different contact to show that one. Let me find a different contact. So one of our finance coding requirements is to assign a specific project code. Um, and they're, they're pretty, they stay the same, the project codes, almost year on year with a few deviations. So we have some custom settings that we've set up that allows us to define what project code should go to which people within which country. So if I edit this, I'm going to update my district again, and I'm going to save it. Now, if you watch this field here, project codes, this is a before update trigger that is now going off, searching against these custom settings and coming back and populating it with the correct code here. But at the same time as that, the after update trigger is then kicking in and going off to the contact and pushing that through into that field there as well. It's, I, I'd love to show you the code, but there's a lot more that goes on on this one for me to be able to show. That's um, a very basic. The idea. caller says that's perfect. You've covered everything that he was that he was interested in. Um, Dan, just you know, you talked about a little bit at the start of the presentation some of the help that you got um, through MVPs um, and other kind of trainings. Can you just explain a little bit about you know where you sourced, how you sourced or connected with MVPs, and you know what kind of training or consultation you might have got at the start? So the, the start was pre-me being with the organisation, to be honest, so I can't entirely answer, but I can tell you what I believe I understand. Um, so initially we started off and we were working with a foundation and one of their partners that they put us in touch with to get us up and running. Um, I can't remember the name of them, but I don't want to name any partners anywhere at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so the initial interaction was done with the foundation directly and this partner to get us up and running on the system. While, whilst this was going on, the foundation w approached us to say, they've got a guy called Peter Chichum who's interested in doing some work, would we have anything that he'd be interested in? Mm -hmm. um, and initially I think it was like a one day engagement where he wanted to come in and do some help. Um, and, and so that was where that relationship started there. We then also, and that, this is a strange one that I'm not entirely clear on how it works, I believe Dan Luton who used to be, I guess, my equivalent to Salesforce knowledge. Um, met a lady called Amy Harbin, who's a Salesforce training expert, um, at one of the Salesforce events. Got talking to her, told her a little bit about CamFed. A week later, she got in touch to say, I really would love to do some work with CamFed. Um, what can I do? I've got some time available as a Salesforce employee that I can give to you. Um, and so she helped develop a five-day training course that she then attended for us. Uh, in Zambia where we trained all of our impact team and program team on a part of the program database that had been built at that time and general use of Salesforce. Since then, um, and since I've come on board, I'm probably somewhat of a stalker in the sense that I, I hunt down MVPs on Twitter, developer forums, events, and anywhere that I can just to bombard them with questions because they always answer. It's what I love about them. They, they never seem too busy to answer a question. And many of them are, like myself, a bit of a tech geek. So they like a challenge or like to be able to impart knowledge so that others can learn. 
Brilliant. Cool. And if um, for people that you know are interested in looking at pro bono services, if you go on to salesforcefoundation.org, um, you can have a look at how you might apply from, for some pro bono um, work from Salesforce employees also. Um, Dan, someone wants to know um, what finance system you're using, if you can say. Mm, financial force. Okay. And I, I don't want I don't want to pitch pitch them, but it's yeah it's been very good so far. Um, and it's more from our point of view, and I touched on it as one of our biggest bug bearers that we've had historically has been the reconciliation of multiple databases to ensure that when we so every year we do something called the evidence in, of investment where we provide all of our donors we put on our website the exact stats of what what we have achieved in the past year as well as cumulative information about the past year prior or hopefully prior to the financial force implementation which only started at the beginning of this year that reconciliation process would take up uh, probably 30 to 40 percent of our finance team program team time during a set period where when you're talking 198,000 students and that reconciliation is an Excel based reconciliation um, and through the implementation of financial force and moving to one girl in the system one school in the system no need to try and reconcile that data we're already seeing a massive cutback and improvement in internal processes and kind of just relieving people from some of those arduous tasks. We used to quite commonly find that some of our finance team would be here until kind of like 10, 11 o'clock at night trying to reconcile data. And there's, that's just, that's gone now. That's now a case of, okay, we'll run a Salesforce report and then, then they're back to doing what they should be doing, which is accounting. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, and just there's a couple of people that want to, if you want to know if you can repeat the name of the app that you're using for um, the roll of summary. Uh, yep. It's Declar. No, it's easier if I just find it. <laughs> so, yeah, this is. So that's the name of it there, Declarative Lookup Rollup Summaries. The page that is on site is the page. It has an installation link on it as well. Um, and this is Andy Fawcett's code repository um, where you can just go and install it. There's a community, so a dedicated chatter group for it. Um, and look, and as you can see, as you come down, it's, it's a very well documented application. Um, it's all about clicks and no code. They, the package itself takes care of the code in the background. And so here are the installation links that he's put up. So you can put it in a sandbox and see how it works. And I'll give you a very quick view of one of ours just so you get an idea. So the only, the, this is it's more of an admin thing would actually know how to do it. But you can see here, so that I, you give it a name, you specify the parent object, and this is why it's important to, to go through some of the trial, trial head early demos to get your head around the data model. Um, so you specify the parent object, the child object, the field that links these two together, and then the process, what you want to do with it. So you can see here you've got a couple of different options, some max, min, average count. Um, and then yeah, there, there's a button here that automatically, when you press, deploys the code in the background that manages it. Uh, or you can do a false calculation where you just press a button here and it will do a false calculation. Um, I haven't hit many issues with it live, apart from the fact that this one's already running. Um, but on the whole, it's, it's a pretty stable application. And any issues you do have, Andy's pretty quick to respond to. Brilliant. Um, everyone's saying thank you so much and how great the presentation was. Um, I'm just going to take back presenter rights for one second. Um, I think we've pretty much finished up on the questions there. Um, and so I just want to quickly draw your attention to an upcoming event that might be interesting to some of you. Um, Dreamforce 
as you might know, is an annual Salesforce conference that is taking place from the 15th to the 18th of September in San Francisco. And um, we had over 7,000 nonprofits attend last year, and we're hoping to increase that number this year. Um, and we'd love to see you there. If you decide to register, there's a nonprofit discount, which means you get your ticket for $350. And um, the code is on the screen right now. And um, you'll also find it on the Salesforce Foundation website. Um, if you have any questions about registering or about attending the event, you can reach out to me directly. Um, my email address is just there on the screen as well. And with that, um, I think we'll close the webinar for today. Dan, thank you so much for sharing your story. And to everyone on the line, thanks for joining. We hope to see you again soon on some of our other webinars. Thanks and thank have a... Much. Thanks, Dan. Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.